i think every american over the age of twelve must be conscious of the word narcotics i think it's a scare word as it should be we know what heroin morphine and cocaine can do to the human body and the human personality people who are hooked on these drugs are seldom hooked in the dark but there's a strong possibility that at this moment in your medicine cabinet you have a drug that can hook you just as completely injure you just as terribly as heroin or morphine. I'm speaking of barbiturates, sleeping pills. Tonight I'm going to tell you the story of the thousands of Americans who suffer the agonies of barbiturate addiction. The tragedy of these people is that their plight is a terrible accident. They started out taking legitimate doses of a legitimate medicine, and suddenly there was a monkey on their backs. Confidential File, a report by Paul Coates, one of the nation's distinguished news reporters, brings you a factual report on America today, its people and their lives. To buy heroin, you have to have a connection. No decent doctor would prescribe morphine in significant amounts without a thorough knowledge of the patient's history. But unfortunately, it's different with the barbiturates. They seem to be considered pretty harmless. And as a rule, they are. But the exceptions are awful exceptions. This story doesn't begin in a backroom dope den. And it doesn't begin with a crazy bunch of young thrill seekers. It begins in a perfectly respectable business office, and it concerns a perfectly respectable woman who's quite a distance away from her carefree teens. Every person who lives is subject to stresses and pressures from outside. For some of us, at some times, the pressures seem almost too much to bear. That's the way she feels right now, as if the entire world were concentrating its aggregate energy into harassing her, picking at her, sniping at her. She'd like to scream, throw a typewriter through the window, or she'd like to cry. Of course, she can't throw a typewriter through the window. She can't cry. She needs the job. But there's another way to gain relief. She's been to a doctor, and he's prescribed mild sedation to carry her over the rough points. And it works, so not immediately, but once she's gotten these little pills inside her, she knows that help is on the way. Half an hour from now, she'll be as calm as a Supreme Court judge. The office ordeal is out of the way for today, but that doesn't mean her day or her problems are over. She comes home to another, even greater responsibility. And to her, responsibility means stress. And stress means panic. Mommy, 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 mommy. It's important that you realize this. The woman we're talking about isn't necessarily a weak woman or an mommy, irresponsible mommy, one. Mommy, mommy, and the actual nature of these stresses shown here are arbitrary. Her office could have been a bridge club. The worrying she does about a child could have been about an overdue bill or an imagined insult. What I'm trying to say is that every human being has a danger point. This woman is reaching hers, and she knows it. When she screams, shut up, she's not talking just to the boys. She's talking to the entire world. She's screaming for relief. And she knows where to find it now. But the bottle's empty, empty much too soon. The doctor told her to be very careful to never, under any circumstances, increase the dosage but she believes they work twice as well if you double the number you take. Of course, you run out twice as quickly and the doctor might catch on to what you're doing, but she's got that figured out too. You just go to two doctors, and then three, and then as many as you can wheedle a prescription out of.
First, she grabs a tube of toothpaste. She wants to make the druggist believe that she just happened to think of the prescription in her purse. One of the first and almost invariable signs of addiction is the victim's anxiety to keep his drug consumption a secret. The addict will manufacture complicated stories to justify his use of the pills. Most often, the stories will involve very serious illnesses which require the drugs as analgesics. Because of her great dependency on the pills, she's afraid he won't sell them to her. Actually, there's no reason he shouldn't. A prescription is perfectly legitimate, and the doctor who wrote it is probably a perfectly legitimate doctor. It's just that she's been seeing too many legitimate doctors. A few hours and a few pills later, she finally seems to be in the clear. Boys in bed, the housework's done, and nothing now until morning. But she won't think about morning yet. Just sleep. It's all she wants. And there's only one way to get sleep. Now she's at ease, nothing to fear. Seven hours of surcease purchased with two little pellets of expanding darkness inside of her. This is the one time she really feels relaxed, just after she's taken the pills. It's the one time when if you asked her, she'd tell you sure she could stop taking the pills anytime she wanted to. She'll insist she isn't hooked. And if you aren't convinced, she'll probably hold out her hand to show you how steady it is. How could she be hooked? There she is going to sleep like a baby and she's only had a couple of dozen pills today. 11.15, sound asleep. 4.35, miserably awake. She can't figure out why she's so restless and then suddenly it occurs to her. She must have forgotten to take her pills before she went to bed. She'll soon fix that. It happens every day. Check an emergency hospital log, any emergency hospital. You take an overdose of barbiturates and you go to sleep. Then you wake up a few hours later and you forgot how much you've taken. She's so groggy she can hardly stand up, but she's convinced a sleeping pill will fix everything. Well, maybe two sleeping pills. Better make it three. Three more pills for three more hours of sleep. tell you something. You don't play with barbiturates that way and get away with it. You end up dead or in a hospital getting your stomach pumped out. Or you end up hooked real bad. You end up not being able to take care of your job or your home. Not being able to take care of yourself. You take pills to knock you out. You drink coffee to pull yourself together. And after a while, neither one really works. You can't go to sleep and you can't wake up. And you don't have that feeling of sweet relaxation anymore. You know now that the pills are killing you, but you don't know how to stop. You find it hard to care now about the things you used to care for most. 
Facing your responsibilities was difficult before. Now it's impossible. Some people are mothers and breadwinners and homemakers. But now you're not any of those things. You're a barbiturate addict. Confidential file will be back in a moment. First, here's a message from our sponsor. May I have your name, please? Clinton H. Thenus. And your age? I'm 58. And your occupation, sir? I am a director of the Institute of Medical Research of the Huntington Memorial Hospital in Pasadena. And how many years of experience have you had, doctor? Over 30 years. Tell me, Dr. Thenus, what are barbiturates? Barbiturates are um, synthetic uh, materials uh, which are derivatives of malonic acid and uh, urea. And what's been their principal use? Uh, to uh, cause sleep and to relieve nervousness. Are they addicting? Uh, yes, they are addicting drugs. And how do barbiturates differ from narcotics in their effect? In general, barbiturates are uh, more sedative. They have practically no stimulating action, whereas morphine, heroin, and the opium derivatives usually stimulate as well as depress. Are the symptom, symptoms of withdrawal the same? They're nearly the same. Uh, they, uh, the muscle pains and the sweating, the nausea and vomiting are not quite so severe as with the opium derivatives, but uh, there is more tendency to insanity uh, during the withdrawal period with the barbiturates. If barbiturates are so dangerous, why are they so readily obtainable, doctor? Well, legally, they are not uh, so readily obtainable. It requires a physician's prescription in this state. In fact, uh, a recent federal law now requires a prescription throughout the United States. But isn't it easy for addicts to circumvent the law? I don't uh, really know the answer to that. Um, I understand that uh, those who wish uh, barbiturates can get them but uh, they have to um, pay good-sized prices for them. What treatment is available to a barbiturate addict? Uh, there is good medical treatment. Uh, it should be sanitarium treatment, preferably, and with a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. well, suppose a strong-willed person tries to shake the habit by himself. Is that possible without any help? It is possible, and it has been done, but it isn't a safe procedure. For occasionally, uh, they will die uh, when they uh, stop taking the drug, and uh, quite a number of addicts uh, will become insane. I want to thank you very much, Dr. Thinnis, for your cooperation tonight. It's been a pleasure to be with you, sir. Thank you. In the film, we showed you the case of an adult addict. It doesn't always happen that way. Sometimes it's worse. May I have your name, please? Hazel Martis. And your age? 52. And your occupation? Houseway. I understand, Mrs. Martis, that you have personal knowledge of problems involved with drug addiction. Yes, I do. I have a son who is in a mental hospital due to the habitual use of benzodrine. How old is your son? He's 28 now. And when did this benzodrine addiction begin? I think at about the age of 16. How did it begin? Well, um, he was a pianist, and he used to play at parties, settlement houses, and so on with the high school band. Mm -hmm. And I do believe that that's when it started. Mm -hmm. Well, did you try to get him any medical attention at that time? Oh, yes, I did. I uh, took him to a medical doctor, and um, he talked to him, but he told me that it was for a psychiatrist, really. Mm -hmm. Did you take him to a psychiatrist? Uh -huh. I took him to a psychiatrist. I got him to go several times. And then he says, Mother, there's no use taking me there. He says, I won't do it anymore, and there's nothing he can do for me. He says. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to quit taking that stuff. 
But he didn't quit, did he? No, he didn't quit. Uh -uh. Mm -hmm. And later on, he uh, started chewing the baton in benzedrine inhalers mm -hmm. that he could buy at any drugstore for a quarter. And chew it like gum? And chew it just like gum. Uh huh. How did he act when he had done that? Well, he'd get very wild acting, very peppy mm -hmm. and very happy. And did you keep trying to find medical help for him? Yes, I did. did it you? was the same thing, a variation of a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And he didn't follow through with any of the psychiatrists? No, he didn't. Uh -uh. I think perhaps at the time, probably at the time I took him, he may have been a l little too far gone, too, that he just seemed like he had to have it when he was working. Mm -hmm. And things kept getting worse then? Right? Worse and worse. And then you had him committed, did you, to a... I, I, yes, uh-huh. How long was he there? He was there ten months. He had a series of shock treatments, and they released him uh -huh. as being well. And then what happened to him? And he was out two years. He worked during the two years and was fine until uh, he evidently started taking them again right. or uh, using the inhalers mostly. Now he's back in the hospital? He's back in now. He's been in three years. And do the doctors feel that he might be released soon? No. He will not be released. They've told you that definitely? Yes. That's right. He's had all the shock treatments that they can give him and the occupational therapy, everything they can do for him. Mm -hmm but uh, he will always remain the same. Well, thank you very much for appearing here with us tonight, Mrs. Martin. The addict who hopes to overcome his habit has a tough fight. The odds are not favorable, but it's a fight that can be won. May I have your name, please? Just your first name. Margaret. And your age? 42. And your occupation? I'm a housewife. Do you have any children? I have three sons. Margaret, how did you start taking barbiturates? I was an alcoholic, and I had been off drink for about 90 days, and I was going through a particularly nervous period, and a well-meaning friend of mine gave me two little yellow capsules, and she told me they would relax me if I took them. Mm -hmm. And did the pills seem to help? Yes. They, uh, they helped me in a great deal. I liked the way they made me feel. How did these pills make you feel, Margaret? They made me feel high and I was floating and all my troubles and my problems seemed remote and I was, uh, seemed unattached. And, uh, When did you know that you were addicted? Well, uh, three or four years after I first started taking them, I, I really knew that I couldn't do without them, but I, I never would admit it. What problems did barbiturates cause in your personal life? Well, my whole life became distorted. Everything revolved around uh, getting these pills and protecting my habit. My friends would uh, ask me why I was acting strangely, and. I was defiant and would insult them and tell them I wasn't taking a thing and it was obvious that I, that I wasn't myself mm -hmm. and I, I just became a pathological liar. And I suppose the pathological lying was always applied to your methods of obtaining the barbiturates. Yes, I uh, used many dishonest means to uh, satisfy this craving. I would uh, go to a strange uh, doctor that didn't know me and uh, ask him, tell him I was a stranger in town, just here for a very few days, and I had forgotten my sleeping pills, and uh, I would ask him if he'd give me a prescription for six, mm -hmm. and uh, I was never turned down, and of course the six was easily made into a 60. Mm -hmm. So after seeing two or three doctors in one day, I could build up quite a supply for myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was a guest in people's homes, the first thing I would do is excuse myself and go to the bathroom, and I would raid their medicine chest. I'd take everything that looked like it might have barbiturate in it. And all this time while you were raiding the medicine cabinets of your friends and doing everything else to get sleeping pills, you were, had no desire to drink. This satisfied you? This, you? Uh, completely. I didn't have a drink at all. How many pills did you take in, let's say, a week? I would, I'd take at least 100 or 150 a week. You'd go on binges, would you? I'd uh, start out, when I first started out, I'd go on binges. They would last uh, three or four days. I'd go to bed and stay completely under the influence of 
uh, barbiturates, the binges became closer and closer together till they almost merged into one big binge and I became terribly frightened. What happened when you tried to break the habit? I uh, would start perspiring from every pore of my body. I, my leg muscles would cramp and I'd be very, very sick at my stomach and I'd be terrified. I don't know what I'd be afraid of, but I'd hear strange noises and uh, shadows and even the movement of a window shade would throw me into a complete uh, state of terror. And when you're lying there so frightened and you know there isn't a pill in the house to relieve your agony, you and, and you know you can't get out to get any, the, the panic you feel, it, it's indescribable. You, it's awful. And you always failed to break the habit by yourself, didn't you? Yes, I always failed to break it by myself. Did you get uh, medical help? Yes, I, uh, the, at the last, the last few years, I'd go to uh, a doctor and tell him my problem, and he would put me in a sanitarium and uh, keep me there from three to five days and uh, withdraw me. And uh, they would feed me, uh, give me an intravenous feeding and build up my strength and taper the barbiturates off till I'd be completely off of them. And how well did the medical withdrawal work? Physically, I would leave the sanitarium feeling pretty good and saying, never again, I've, I've really had it. But deep down, I knew that eventually there would be, there'd come a day when I would be angry or depressed or there would be some excuse for my taking a pill again, and then I'd be right back where I started. And you were correct in that deep down feeling, weren't you? Yes, I was. Did you find barbiturate addiction to be as tough as the fight against alcoholism for you? For me, it, it was much tougher. Would you uh, explain that to me? Well, barbiturates don't uh, smell on your breath. You can get by with it easier, or for a while, and you they're easier to conceal and to carry around with you. And then you always have the wonderful excuse that you're using them as a medication. Margaret, how did your addiction affect your family? I couldn't uh, be a, a mother. I couldn't be a wife. I couldn't be a homemaker. I was completely useless to myself and everyone around me. My will was just completely gone. Are you still taking the pills? No, I'm not taking them, and I hope I never do. How did you stop, and how long ago did you stop? I finally went into a sanitarium where I received psychotherapy along with the physical treatment. Mm -hmm. And it was there that I admitted and faced the problem squarely that I was a barbiturate addict. Mm -hmm. And secondly, I knew that I wanted to quit more than I wanted anything else in the world. Are you still taking treatment? Yes, I, I still see a psychiatrist twice a week. Is the treatment very expensive? Well, to me, it's very expensive. It costs me $30 a week. How does that compare with the cost of the pill habit you had? It's about the same. Mm -hmm. Are you still bothered by a desire for barbiturates? I'm still afraid of them. I, I don't think the obsession has completely left mm -hmm. me. For example, if I see a little red bead on the floor, immediately I'll start thinking of a second off uh, capsule. And as long as I have this fear, I, I know that I'm going to have to be constantly on guard. Mm -hmm. Who or what do you think is at fault for your addiction to barbiturates? In the last analysis, I, I am at fault for my addiction. However, I think that they're too easy to get. I think that doctors give them out much too freely they don't find out the patient's background. And uh, I think that the laws are too lax. I think they should be treated just like a narcotic because barbiturates are just as dangerous as narcotics. And it's much easier to overdose yourself with barbiturates because after you've taken a few, you, you don't know how many you've taken. Well, thank you very much, Margaret. You're a remarkably brave woman, and I appreciate what you said here tonight. Thank you. Barbiturates and the other drugs we've discussed tonight are valuable medicines. 
The purpose of this report is not to discourage their use under proper medical supervision, but when you use them, use them exactly as the doctor has instructed. Don't increase the dosage just because you think you'd sleep twice as well. And don't use them any longer than the doctor says is necessary. Violent death and insanity are pretty ugly words, but they're good words to remember. Now, here's a final message from Confidential File Sponsor. just witnessed another authentic report by Paul Coates, distinguished columnist and news reporter. These factual reports are brought to you each week by this station. They reflect those of station or sponsor.